Welcome to episode three in our Radio Design 101 series. Today we're going to talk about RF amplifiers, but more generally about amplifiers. And what we're going to cover starts with vacuum tubes, but will very quickly progress to transistors and ultimately maybe even touch on some integrated circuit designs. The focus in this is at the schematic level, as it has been in our previous videos. So if you've seen episodes one and two, you kind of know what to expect. If you haven't seen those episodes, don't worry. I'm trying to keep these relatively independent, so you can watch this one and go back to those. At the bottom here is a schematic of an amplifier, which has appeared in several of the videos on this channel. But this video is not focused on this amp. This video is intended to illuminate how amplifiers work, regardless of the technology, whether it's a vacuum tube, as shown here, or a transistor, or maybe even an integrated circuit. Our goal is to illuminate the theory behind all of these. Now, before we dive into the theory in depth, let's take a look at three schematics. This is a ham radio SB102 high frequency single sideband transceiver. And as you can obviously see, it's built with tubes. What I'm hoping is that after today's talk, we will be able to understand much better what each of these stages does. But real quick, before we get going, let me just kind of walk you through. Uh, this is the microphone input. You can see it physically up here at the top. Microphone input comes in. Uh, this V1A is a gain of about 100 amplifier. How do I know that? Well, that's kind of what we're covering today. And the signal comes out amplified here, goes through a potentiometer for volume control, and then it goes into this thing called a cathode follower. And the question is, what is that for? Now, some of you may know, some of you may not. Basically, it's a buffer. It allows this amplification to happen while simultaneously producing a low impedance output that can drive this circuitry, which is the modulator. Similarly, there's another thing called an isolation amplifier here. We're going to end up calling that a common grid amplifier, as we'll see. And then there's some RF amplifiers over here. Now, these have LC tuned circuits associated with them. And I would refer you back to episodes one and two for kind of what's going on there. Moving up a few decades in time, this is a VHF FM broadcast receiver. It's a Pioneer SX535 that I once owned. And you can see a picture of it as well as the schematic. Uh, this is the circuitry that takes the antenna in over here on the left and goes through an amplifier and then it goes to a mixer, and then it goes to the IF subsection. The amplifier is shown here in schematic form, and if you've watched those other videos, then you'll probably recognize this as an impedance matching network. That's not our focus today. I refer you to that video. Our focus today is to talk about how the amplifier works, specifically how this transistor amplifier works in this case. The output from this amplifier uh, is taken from here, again, an impedance matching network as well as bandpass filtering. And then it goes over to this device, which is a bipolar junction transistor BJT. This was a junction field effect transistor over here. Uh, the BJT can also be used for amplifiers, as we'll see. And the theory is common. It doesn't matter if it's tubes or JFETs or BJTs. What we're going to cover is a common theory behind all of this. And finally, to show that we're not stuck in the past, this is actually a single chip UHF transceiver that uses QPSK modulation that was done on a research project. The picture that you can see here on the left is a die photograph. This is actually a three by three millimeter integrated circuit. And the amplifier that is, has a schematic is this lower left corner. What we're going to do today is be talking about schematic level circuitry. And these are MOSFETs, but as we said, they're going to work just the same as the others. There's some subtle differences, but we're going to cover common theory. And I hope that at the end of this, we're going to be able to walk through this and explain what's going on with each of these transistors and why they are configured the way they are. So here's our topic outline. 
Now there's a lot of topics here and it's going to take a while to cover these. So as I've suggested in previous videos, you might want to pause it at some point and maybe even come back to the whole thing. I thought about dividing this into a part one and part two as I did with episodes one and two, but I wanted to cover enough that we have a complete vision at the end of this. So it might be a little long, but please stay with us. We're going to start talking about triode devices, those different transistors and tubes that we just saw before. And here are two of the four devices that we're going to be discussing. One is, of course, the vacuum tube, or if you're across the pond, that would be a valve. And here's a few photos of two different types of vacuum tubes. An older one, a CRC-808, probably from the 1930s, I don't know exactly. And then this is a more modern one that actually has two tubes inside a single casing. So let's just take a look at one, the most simplified one. This is a triode vacuum tube, as many of you probably know. What happens here is that there's a heater inside. You can see it glowing. And that's represented down here. I have not hooked it up to a power supply, but it would have to be in order to heat. That then does what's called boiling off electrons. Basically, it imparts kinetic energy to the electrons in a metal called the cathode. And they jump off of the cathode and accumulate nearby in what's called a space charge region. All right, now, you put a high voltage on this other terminal, which is an outer uh, cylinder. It's this piece right here called the plate. And if it's positive, then the electrons will be pulled towards that, and you have current flow. Except current is in the other direction, of course. Very confusing, not my fault. Uh, but we have electrons moving this way, we have current going this way. Except if you put a voltage on the third terminal, I'm going to call it the third terminal. It's actually called the grid here. But in all of these devices, you'll see that there's a third terminal, which is a control terminal. And what happens with that is you can vary the voltage, and that will vary the current. And that's what we see in the graph over here on the right. This is the current on this axis, and this is the voltage here. If you make this voltage negative enough on the grid, the control terminal, then the current will completely shut off. But more importantly, as you vary it, you vary the current. So if you've got this much voltage on it, you've got that much current. If you increase the voltage towards zero, then you've got more current. If you go to zero, you've got even more current. What about the transistors? Well, the interesting thing is, and the good thing is, the same theory applies. There's a terminal here called the source, in this case, uh, that has electrons that can move to the other terminal called the drain. And then the third terminal is, of course, called the gate in this transistor terminology for a junction field effect transistor. But look, the curves are exactly the same. And it's these curves that we rely on to make an amplifier and to understand how it works and to design it. Now, two other devices that we can make amplifiers out of include the bipolar junction transistor. This is the original one from 1947. This is a common surface mount one that you might buy today, very small package here. It has three terminals. And again, electrons here at what's called the emitter in this case. If we put a positive voltage on the other terminal called the collector, then the electrons move this way and current goes that way. And it's all under the control of what's called the base emitter voltage, the base being the control terminal. Now, a subtle difference, or maybe not so subtle, is that in this device, you actually don't use negative voltages. You use positive voltages on that control terminal. And you have to get up to a threshold, usually taken as 0.7 volts. But it varies. It can start conducting at 0.6. It depends on how much current you're dealing with. Similarly, Metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors, MOSFETs, have the three terminals, source, drain, and gate, echoing the same language for the JFET. But these operate differently. This is an enhancement mode MOSFET. So again, nothing happens until you get up to a certain threshold, and then the current starts to flow. And the higher voltage you put on it, the more current. And that's the controlling feature that will allow us to create amplifiers. There is a key element here called transconductance. 
which is the ratio of how much the current changes for a given change in voltage. And we're going to give that the symbol G sub M. And you'll see that when we discuss amplifiers coming up. Now an amplifier, of course, is a circuit that takes a small voltage, usually time varying. Here I've drawn it as a sine wave and creates a bigger version of that. So if you go over to the bottom right, you can see a much larger sine wave. Now, in order to make this larger sine wave, what we do is we take advantage of that control terminal on the device, whatever device we're using. Here it's a BJT. In the next slide, it's going to be a vacuum tube. doesn't matter. And what we do is we have to put a bias on it. Uh, so we have this VBE source here to get some current flowing. And then we impress this smaller variation on top of that so that the sum of these two, because they're in series, looks like this. So it's centered around, we'll call it 0.7 volts, and it goes up a little and it goes down a little, up a little. And as it does that, if you look at the top right here, the graph of current, this is the current into the collector, it goes up when the controlling voltage goes up and then it goes down when the controlling voltage goes down, all about some nominal point that we call I0, the bias current. Now, in order to create voltage, we have a resistor. And the resistor is between the positive power supply voltage here and the collector. And as the current is drawn through that, we get a voltage drop across it. And the more current goes through this resistor, the more voltage drops. So as this current goes up, the voltage at the output goes down, and vice versa. Now, whether or not it's an amplifier depends on how much the current changes with a given change in the control voltage, and also on the resistance. The equation is down here. This is fundamental to amplifiers. This is it's as important as Ohm's law is when you're getting into signal processing circuits. This is the basic gain equation. We will see more complicated versions of it uh, and some variants on it, but this is the basic equation. The voltage gain is the transconductance times a resistance. And in this case, there's a negative sign because, as I said, the output voltage is inverted with respect to the input voltage. And here's the vacuum tube case. Have a small input voltage as before. We bias it. In this case, we have to bias it negative because of the transfer characteristics of the vacuum tube are different than they were for the BJT transistor, as we just discussed. But we put a bias voltage on it to get a nominal current flowing. And then as we vary the voltage on the controlling terminal, in this case it's called the grid, uh, with respect to this terminal down here called the cathode, where the electrons are emitted, then the current goes up and down accordingly. And again, there's a resistance here. Now, I threw in a difference here. I made this an RF amplifier. And I did that by putting an LC tuned circuit at the output, as we've discussed in previous videos. And so a difference is that this voltage is at V++ nominally, where the V++ is the power supply voltage for the plate terminal. And it can actually then go down, but it can also go up above whatever this power supply voltage is, which is kind of weird, but makes sense when you realize that this is an inductor and it stores energy and it can produce a back EMF, and that can add to this voltage in certain situations <clears throat> and make this voltage higher. So something to remember about RF amplifiers is that the output voltage can go above the power supply. Notice, however, that the voltage gain equation is the same here, except it's only at F0. This is a bandpass filtering operation with this LC, and so only at F0 will you get the full gain. At other frequencies below and above, you will have less gain, as discussed in the previous videos. Now, where do we get that transconductance, that GM value from? Well, this is a data sheet from, I believe this is a 12AX7, which is a dual triode tube. And you can see in some of the uh, tabular data here that they have what's called an amplification factor, sometimes called mu, but there's also the transconductance here. And in this case, it's 1250 micromoles. Now, the plate resistance is also listed as 
80,000. And if that was the only resistance involved, then we would have the gain would be the multiplication of the transconductance and the 80k ohm. And that gives us the minus 100. And the 100 is the amplification factor they list. Now, if you're a vacuum tube designer person, you probably know that the actual gain will be somewhat less than this. Depends on that plate resistor value that you put. This resistance is a subtle issue of what goes on inside the tube itself. So you actually have the plate resistor in your schematic in parallel with this. Those are some of the subtleties that as we get into detailed amplifier design, we have to understand. But the basic equation is the voltage gain, the ratio of the output voltage size to the input voltage size, is gm times r, with a minus sign in this case. For a bipolar junction transistor, as shown here, you will not find the transconductance value listed in the data sheet. That's because it depends highly on the current that you flow through it. And I've put the equation down here in the lower right. It's actually GM transconductance is equal to IC over NVT, where VT is 0.026 at room temperature, and N is some number that varies between 1 and 2. I just chose something in the middle and crunched this out, and I got 0.04 for the denominator. It's approximate, but it'll get you going. And so whatever the collector current is, divided by 0.04. So for example, if you were flowing 40 milliamps, 0.04 amps, then GM would be 1. 1 what? 1 amp per volt. So when you run the equations, you got to keep your units right, uh, but this is the equation that we need to use for BJTs. So how do we make an amplifier in practice? Well, that simple circuit that explains how the amp works is not really practical for reasons that we'll discuss. And so you end up with what are called bias circuits, that have to create a stable bias current for your device, but we're always using the basic idea of taking the input signal in and controlling the voltage between the control terminal and that source terminal or cathode or emitter or whatever, and that modulates the current. And then that is changed to a voltage at the output. This is a tube amp. This is a JFET amp. They work the same way in that sense. This is a BJT. Subtle difference here. This is the one we've talked about in previous videos and shown a lot. Uh, here, the voltage is actually coming in on the emitter, and the base is what's called AC grounded. But what this ends up doing, as we'll show, is it still modulates the it modulates or changes the voltage time varying between the base and the emitter, and that changes the current. So we're just coming in on the emitter and fixing the base instead of coming in on the base and fixing the emitter. And then down here is a MOSFET amp. This actually has a second transistor in it or a second gate, and we'll talk about why that is. Gives you a lot of advantages, as we'll see. Okay, the next topic is DC biasing. Getting the device turned on and ready to be able to control that current and make it a little bigger, a little smaller, and so forth, as we've discussed. The circuit that we have presented so far doesn't actually work in practice very well. For one thing, there's multiple batteries shown here, one to bias the base emitter and one to set up the power supply for the overall transistor circuit. Also, equally importantly, the uh, bias current in this case is not very stable because that 0.7 volts is not some magic perfect number. It varies depending on temperature and the device itself. And so it has to be precisely manipulated to get the current that you want. And we'll see how to do that in a moment. And then finally, in this particular example, the input source is not grounded, and that's unusual. There are ways to deal with it. But overall, this is not a good way to set up your amplifier. Here is the way that we've done it in the circuit shown in previous videos. And this is a practical biasing circuit for the bipolar junction transistor. Bias circuits change depending on the device, and we don't have time in this video to cover all of them, so I'm just going to use this as a surrogate. Just look at the BJT 
and then we will at the end look at the vacuum tubes and kind of talk briefly how that works. You have to dive deeper if you want to understand more about biasing. But let's look at biasing here. So there is a power supply voltage. That's that uh, positive power supply that we showed earlier. And in this case, there is an LC tuned circuit. And so what happens is that positive power supply, this is a DC short. So basically, whatever voltage it is, I'm going to assume it's 5 volts, shows up here on the collector. Now, what voltage is on the base? Well, that's easy. It's whatever this voltage is at the top, 5 volts, and there's a voltage divider. And so if you use these resistor values, 2.2K over 2.2K plus 4.7K, and then multiply by 5, you get 1.6 volts. And so that's the voltage here. And remember, when th this thing turns on, when there's 0.7 volts across here, so basically if it is on, this emitter voltage is 0.7 volts below that. So that's how I got the 0.9 volts here. Once you know there's 0.9 volts on the emitter, we've got a resistor to ground, and we use Ohm's law, and we can calculate, we get 5 milliamps. And this is what we did in the previous video when we talked about this amplifier. And so we've got a bias point, and more importantly, we have a current, and it's 5 milliamps, and it's pretty stable. And I'm not going to go into the details on how I can prove that, but I will give you a summary sheet that uh, can you can think through for that. A couple other things here. Um, notice that this 0.9 volts does not show up on the input. That's because there's a DC blocking capacitor. Many of you know these things, so hopefully you'll stay with me here um, and you'll get something new at some point. Um, this is a DC block. Many people call it an AC coupling capacitor. It does both. It passes the AC signal through and it blocks the DC that is part of the biasing from getting to the source. In addition, as we've shown in previous videos, this capacitor can actually be part of an L matching network. So check out episode two if you want to see that. So here is that detailed walkthrough of biasing circuits for the BJT. This is a classic or traditional four resistor bias circuit that we used. And I am not going to walk through this. Otherwise, this video is going to be too long. If you want to, freeze it here and read through it. And it will explain why the bias current ends up very stable in this case. And also give a few other caveats about things you need to look at. This is the analysis. This next page is the design procedure, which basically takes the analysis and inverts it. Uh, but this is kind of a cookbook procedure for how to bias a BJT amplifier using the four resistor classic traditional bias network. And there are dozens of other ways to bias circuits, depending on the device type and the kind of amplifier you're trying to create. So here are two of those dozens. And I'm not going to walk through them in detail, but I did want to point out that this is a Class C power amp. And the interesting feature of it is it is not biased on initially. So this device is off initially. There's an inductor here and a resistor to ground. Sometimes it's just an inductor to ground. But this DC voltage here on the base is zero. So this device is initially off. And what happens is you need a sufficiently large input voltage from a so-called driver amp that will create a voltage VN which reaches above the 0 0.7 volts that is required to turn this device on. And so that will happen, let's say, near the peak of the input voltage cycle. And then the input voltage goes negative and the transistor's off. And then it goes positive again and it turns the transistor on, but only briefly. And so what happens is we get these current pulses. So the collector current, instead of being a nominal value that goes up and down, it's normally off. And then we get some sharp peaks here. And the way a Class C amplifier like this works is the bandpass filter here at the output takes these peaks and turns them into a sine wave at the resonant frequency of the LC network. And therefore, I get a sine wave as shown here. And the interesting and useful feature of this is the way it works out, when the current is peak, the voltage is almost zero 
from the collector to the emitter. And power is voltage times current, and so you've got a very small power here when the voltage is zero, even though the current is significant. Moreover, you have no power being dissipated in the transistor at other times. So you only have a few times where the transistor is dissipating significant power. Otherwise, what's happening is this output voltage is getting passed through the matching network so that we can get the right impedance level, but it goes to the load. So you end up with power V squared over R, if you take the RMS of the ear, and you end up with power at the output, but very little dissipated power. And that's what a Class C amplifier does. It's designed to take as much of the power supply power as possible and put that out as RF power without dissipating that as heat. Over here on the right is a amplifier. It's a segment of a 6EA8 vacuum tube. And the reason I threw this in is because it doesn't use a voltage divider. It uses a grid bias resistor here tied to ground and then a cathode resistor here that voltage develops across it in the polarity shown. And it turns out that that creates a negative gate with respect to the cathode, which is what you want. Now coming back to our main circuit, this is a class A amplifier because we have current flowing all the time. It's 5 milliamps nominal bias current and then the voltage coming in here at the emitter modulates the base emitter voltage and that varies that current about this 5 milliamp bias point up and down. And that AC behavior for an amplifier is typically what we're most interested in. We want to know the gain of the amplifier, but we also have to know the input and output impedances of the amplifier because those interact with the source and load impedances as we'll see. So here is that amplifier that we featured in previous videos. And I've annotated all the waveforms on here I could think of. There's the source voltage over here. And the source is represented as a Thevenin source, meaning there's a voltage here, an AC voltage, in series with a source resistance. The amplifier begins here at this bubble. And if you've seen the other episodes, you know that this is a matching network, which is going from a high impedance, let's call it 50 ohms, down to a lower impedance called 10 ohms, for example, in episode 2. And as we do that, the voltage source, two things happen. One is it's driving into 50 ohms here, and if this is a 50 ohm source, then the input voltage is less than the source voltage. In fact, it would be a half. I've tried to draw it as less here. Then what happens is it goes through this matching network, which matches down to 10 ohms, so it's even less variation than it is here, and that's what you see down here at the bottom on the emitter. It's a smaller voltage, but it's still time varying, and it's still varying the voltage. This is on the emitter, 0.9 volt bias, Remember, there's 1.6 on the base, as shown here in this graph, a constant 1.6. C4 helps make it a constant. That's called an AC bypass capacitor. So you got to have that to make it constant. And if you take the difference between the base and the emitter, you get the graph in the upper right. And that's basically 0.7 that moves up and down. And that's the varying voltage across this junction that creates the varying current. The bias current was established at 5 milliamps, as shown here on the right, and then it's going down and up because VB minus VE is going down and up. If you reason through the difference between these, you can see this. So it's going down and up, about the 5 milliamp bias point, and the voltage here at the collector is in the DC solution 5 volts because it's tied through L2, but then it goes up and down as the current goes down and up. And why is that? Well, the easiest way I can remember it is that when the current is high here, and remember the LC tuned circuit is an open circuit at the resonant frequency, so just think about R4 here. We'll bring in this later. Think about R4, 
the more current you have pulled through here, the lower the voltage. So as this current goes up, the voltage goes down. All right, and then finally what happens is there's a matching network which contains also a DC block slash AC coupling capacitor serving all the same purpose. And that creates the output voltage on the load, which is centered about DC because you've got the blocking capacitor. Notice that it's also smaller in magnitude than the collector voltage, and that's because of the match from in the previous video, this was 3K down to 50 ohms. So that impedance change from 3K down to 50 is associated with a voltage change as reviewed in the previous video. And we can see it here on the right as a smaller load voltage variation than on the collector itself. So this is the full picture in what's called the time domain. These are time varying voltages. If you've watched the other videos, you know that I'm all about these nano VNA devices, and we've looked at the frequency response of this amplifier in episode two, and it's shown here in blue. That's the S21 curve. This amber curve is S11, and that gives us an indication of the input impedance. And if you know Smith charts or you've watched those videos, you know that we're pretty close to 50 ohms here at the peak gain point due to this matching network here. So from this point forward, what we really care about is the gain of the amplifier here. I call it the core amplifier. And the matching. And what are we matching from? We're matching from the source impedance, whatever's driving this thing, to the input impedance of the amplifier. And then from the output impedance of the amplifier, 3K in the example, down to the load impedance value. So as we look at this complicated looking circuit, over time it becomes more familiar and less complicated looking, but we also identify a number of sub-circuits involved. There is the core amplifier, which itself contains some bandpass filtering, but there's also the input match between the source and the input of the core amp, and an output match between the output of the core amp and the load. And what we're going to do, we're going to be focused on these AC signals and these impedance levels. That's what it's all about, is the impedance levels and the gains. And here's how we're going to focus on that. What you see in the middle here is what's called an AC small signal model for the core amplifier, which I have boxed up here. I've replicated that previous diagram. And we're going to replace all of this complicated stuff with just this circuit here, recognizing that we're not talking about the DC voltages anymore or the total voltages. We're only talking about the AC variations. So there's the input voltage here that comes into this core amplifier section, and there's the output voltage here that comes out of it and goes into the output match. And in between there is a model, and it's a simplified equivalent circuit. So it does everything that this circuitry does to the AC component of the signals. And it's a simplified equivalent circuit that consists only of an input resistance and an output resistance and a what's called a controlled voltage source that has the gain value times the input voltage. And we can do this. We can replace all of this circuitry up here with something much simpler by employing basically what's called Thevenin's theorem and linear systems theory. We're not going to do that here. That's what four years of university is about to provide all these circuit analysis theorems and so forth. But a practicing engineer doesn't worry about that anymore. They know that what we care about is the input impedance of the amp, the output impedance, and the gain. That's the key element set that matters. Now, I made a few notes down here at the bottom. Uh, these input output resistances and the gain depend on the amplifier device, i.e. its transconductance, um, its circuit configuration, as we'll get into here shortly, and the biasing, which sets the current, for example, and hence changes the GM value. The other note is that, in general, this is not a perfect model because these are just resistances 
And there is more complexity up here due to capacitances inside the elements. And so in general, we need to talk about Z in and Z out and a complex frequency dependent voltage gain. But this simplified treatment is good enough for this course, but it's also good enough for actually designing real amplifiers, usually. Using that simplified model, here it is down at the bottom center. Remember, it's flanked by an input matching network and an output matching network. And I've annotated the impedances here in this bottom figure. The input resistance is what you see looking in, and that's clear because it's just a resistance to ground here. The source resistance that drives into that is actually modified by this matching network, so I call it RS prime instead of RS. Similarly, if you stand at the left side of the matching network, you don't see the input resistance of the core amp, you see it through the matching network, so instead of RN, it's RN prime. In the previous example, this was 10 ohms, and we bumped that up to 50 ohms using the matching network. Similar things happen at the output, and I'm not going to talk through that. You can think through that. Maybe pause it here, look at it, think about it, and now we'll move forward. So this all probably seems pretty complicated. But in the end, we end up with a much simplified circuit down here in the bottom. What this is at the bottom is the core amp, as I'm circling here in the center, looking out toward the source through the matching network. So we're going to forget about the matching network. We're just going to consider the source now as having a source impedance RS prime. And so what we have on the input side now is just a voltage divider. It's that simple. All that matters is we characterize and understand the circuit we're designing in terms of its input resistance or its input impedance and how that relates to the source impedance that it sees through a matching network or if it doesn't have a matching network then directly to the source. Similarly on the output side we're looking through an output matching network but let's forget that and just assume that we've got an RL prime value hanging on the output of our core amp. That's what the amp sees. In the previous video, when we were talking about designing this matching network, what we noted was that the output impedance of this core amp was 3K, and we wanted to basically make the load look like 3K. That's how we designed the matching network. So in this case, this is 3K, and this is 3K. So because of the voltage division then, the gain from V in to V out is one half of the what's called the unloaded gain AV naught, the core amplifier gain AV naught. And that's the kind of reasoning that we go through with this simplified circuit to understand how this is going to behave in practice and what loading is going to do to us. And ultimately, we can actually then calculate power gain that way. Now I thought about adding the power gain equation here. You can maybe reason through it, but I think I'll save that for a potential part two to this video. However, don't stop here. This is what's going to be in part two, or some of it, but it's also what's coming up in the next few slides. So I didn't want to end without really going through the amplifier configurations and how we understand the input and output impedances of different core amplifier designs. Then we're going to very briefly talk about high frequency limitations, saving the bulk of that for a possible part two video. And we'll look at some data sheets and go back to those circuit examples that we started with. All right, so here is a preview of discussion of amplifier configurations. I'm not going to walk through every one of these in detail. But let me zoom in on the first one. So this first one here is a common emitter amplifier. This is probably more likely what you're going to encounter in a lot of situations. Some of those tube amplifiers were the equivalent of one of these. The amplifier you just saw, though, is what's called a common base amplifier. And that's because we come in on the emitter, 
with our input signal. The base is AC grounded, and we go out on the collector. So the base is common. This is an AC ground. The input signal is from the emitter to that common ground. The output signal is from the collector to that common ground. What are the formulas that describe this amplifier? Well, the no load voltage gain is GM times R. Here, the R is mainly this RC value, but there may be some internal resistance uh, in the transistor device itself. With the BJT, fortunately, you can treat R0 as infinity, so this is just GM times R, whatever this resistor value is here. The input resistance is given by this formula where RE is this biasing resistor, R pi is something inside this BJT, but the dominant term is 1 over GM. If you ignore these other terms, you just say RN is 1 over GM, you get pretty close. The output resistance of this amp is just this RC value, if R0 is very big, which it is for BJT. So this is the characterization of the common base amp. Let me go over to this next column. So for the common base amp, the AV no load is usually high. The input resistance is 1 over GM. That turns out to be a low number, like 10 ohms in our example. And the output resistance is what I'll call medium, which was like 3K. Now, there are other amplifiers here, such as the common emitter one. They differ in that the formula for the gain is a little different, the formula for the input resistance is significantly different, and the formula for the output resistance is about the same. Notice, however, that the Rn value of this amplifier is what I'll call medium as opposed to low. Why am I saying all of this? Well, because when you cascade amplifiers, you end up with loading. And that takes away some of the gain that you try to build by stringing amplifiers together in a cascade. Using these different configurations, you can mitigate those problems. In particular, there's another one called the common collector or emitter follower. And it has a gain of 1, which is seemingly useless, but it's not because the input resistance for this thing is very high and the output resistance is very low. So it's good at driving any load you want, and it doesn't load whatever source you have. So this is often called a buffer, or sometimes an emitter follower. Signal comes in on the base, goes out on the emitter. That's how we recognize what's a common collector configuration versus the common base versus the common emitter. It's where the input signal comes in, where the output signal goes out. And here are two other configurations that you can look through at your leisure. I'm not going to talk through them in any detail. I will mention, however, that this is a common emitter with emitter resistor. It has a little bit less gain, a little bit higher input impedance. This is a CAS code. This is very important for RF design, as we will see. The reason it's important for RF design as we'll see in a possible part two of this video, is that these transistors have internal capacitances. And ultimately, at very high frequencies, those internal capacitances end up with low impedances that basically lower the output signal levels. They decrease the gain. In fact, they put a cap on the gain at what's called the gain bandwidth product of the device. And so we care about these capacitances, and it turns out that this cascode configuration, which is a cascade of common emitter and common base, it's a compound amplifier, it actually decreases the effect of those capacitances and makes the amplifier work to much higher frequency. In addition, the cascode amp works much like the basic common emitter but the output resistance is much higher. This is the formula. I'm not going to go through it in detail. But essentially, if you have a device such as a MOSFET or a triode vacuum tube, it can increase the output resistance and increase your overall gain. So that's very good. And so under output resistance column, I've changed this to medium high versus what it was 
with the common emitter where it was just labeled medium. Okay, to wrap this up, we are going to wrap it up. Um, let's look at these three example circuits real quickly. Uh, we might look at them again in a part two video. But let's take what we've just learned and look at these. This is the input circuitry for the microphone. It goes through this first stage. This is a pentode vacuum tube, but it turns out that it's essentially the same as a cast code configuration of a modern transistor amplifier. And the output signal comes out here, and it goes into this amp, which comes in on the grid and goes out on the cathode. Okay, that's interesting. And look, there's an AC bypass capacitor on the plate. This is the configuration that has the low output impedance and high input impedance. So what we're doing is we're using a high input impedance here to not load down the previous stage, and we're using the low output impedance behavior to drive another circuit that requires a fair amount of current going into it. So there's an example of that. This is essentially a CAS code or common cathode. This is a cathode follower or common plate. And then over here is something they call an isolation amplifier. This is essentially a common grid amp because if you look at the grid, it's AC grounded here. The signal comes in on the cathode and goes out on the plate. So that is essentially the same as one of these common base amps here that has a high gain, a fairly low input impedance, and a medium output impedance. Looking at our next circuit, we have a JFET. And the question is, what configuration is this? Well, the source is grounded, and the input signal comes in on the gate, and the output signal is on the drain. So this is basically a common source amp. What are the features of a common source amp? Well, it's essentially similar to a common emitter amp. There's one central difference with the JFET um, the input resistance doesn't have this R pi term, and so it can be reasonably high in the junction field effect transistor case. And the third example circuit is shown here. There's an input match, which you can probably recognize at this point. What's this? It's a blocking capacitor or a coupling cap. And then these are PFETs, so we'll have to cover these perhaps in the part two video. Essentially, though, if you kind of stand on your head and look at this thing, it's an upside-down version of a CAS code amp with an LC load. And so the input signal comes in here, and it goes out here. And it has high gain and high frequency response characteristics. And then we go into this amplifier, and this configuration takes a single-ended signal and converts it to a differential signal. So there's two opposite polarity signals coming out here, one at the drain of M9 and one at the drain of M8. And then those go through M12 and M13 to the final outputs, which goes on to a mixer. What configuration are these transistors and why are they here? Well, comes in on the gate, goes out on the source. What's common? It's the drain. So this is a source follower with a low output impedance capable of driving substantial loads. So that was placed between the output of the CAS code and the load in order to not have the load uh, be directly on the output of this amplifier, which would lower the overall gain. So we'll cover more of that in what looks like we're going to have to do a part two now, because uh, we can't go into detail on that right in this video. But what I want you to remember is that core amplifier concept. The concept of characterizing whatever amp you're dealing with, doesn't matter if it's tube or transistor, JFET, BJT, we all have these common emitter, common base, common collector analogs, and this concept of a CAS code. These are central. It's been unchanged for 100 years. And if you understand amplifiers in these terms, and in the term of the simplified AC model of input resistance, output resistance, and unloaded gain, and then place that with a source load around it, you can understand what's going on.
to, de to design things, you also need data sheets. Uh, here is an example data sheet for a transistor we use in our course, a uh, 5179 device. Here's some things we'll talk about in the next video in terms of the current game bandwidth product, the internal capacitance values, and a way to find out what the RPI value is. And a lot of these data sheets have graphs in them, and we'll cover this in the next video. All right. I hope that wasn't too much. Look at this again. You're not going to be able to absorb this all in one setting, but I tried to pack everything into this that gives you a grounding for understanding amplifiers of all types. I hope you found it useful. Uh, ask questions and stay tuned for part two at sometime in the future. Thank you for watching.